Today, there are two million descendants of French Canadian immigrants living in New England. These are our stories. Welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Venez tous jeunes filles et garçons, je vais vous raconter l'histoire de notre immigration ici au USA, de grands aventuriers de pays étrangers. This is the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. I am Jesse Martineau. Now, as I have spoken about quite a bit on this show in May, the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, the OIF, hosted a book launch event for the book French All Around Us, French Language and Francophone Culture in the United States. And this was at their offices at the United Nations in New York City. Now, the OIF had a panel discussion featuring some distinguished guests, including the ambassador, which is very cool, uh, as well as the two amazing editors of the project, Kathleen Stein-Smith and Fabrice Jumont. I was fortunate enough to be able to participate in the discussion. Definitely one of the coolest things that I have ever done. However, what I guess the crowd at home did not necessarily see was that after the recording stopped, the group, group, all of us, got to watch a clip from an amazing new film called Toujours Isit. And today, I have the absolute privilege to be speaking with the creator of this terrific film, Brian Hawkins. Brian, welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to start with your story. So where are you from? Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Harrisonville, Missouri, which is a little bit south of Kansas City. I always was interested in in the arts, in drawing and in playing music. Studied studied printmaking, actually, in, in college. When I was in grad school, I got into making these stop-motion animations using cut paper. So it just sort of... D- developed naturally and i think that animation i was i sort of gravitated towards that uh medium because having sort of a musical background and this you know interest in visual arts those two things really combine really well uh in animation because you're you're developing images over time and playing around with the pacing of things what made you decide you wanted to turn that into creating film so the there are a couple of reasons. I, I like stories uh, is the first reason, I would say. And so, you know, it's you can make a, a painting that, that has a lot of sort of symbolism and sort of an implication of a sort of narrative. But that was that was another reason that I really gravitated towards towards making animations was that I could, you know, you can work as a painter, but you can also tell a sort of a cinematic story at the same time. I also, you know, from childhood really was interested in history, um, but not really in the sense that like, you know, it's taught in schools most of the time where it's a series of dates and battles and things like that. I really had a, an excellent teacher sure. um, at one point who who really made us a connection with just sort of everyday life in the past and, and kind of tried to, to teach us how to think about you know, the past not necessarily being, or history, I guess, not necessarily being the accumulation of these large events, but also just the way that everyday people have lived their lives over the years and how that has a huge impact. You know, when I was in grad school, I, I was working a lot with Missouri history and folklore and made a whole body of work that was that was sort of centered around ragtime music, which developed in Missouri, um, St. Cool. Louis specifically. And after, uh, after I graduated, I was looking around for other material to work with that was kind of in that vein. And being a, a fan of ragtime and early jazz, you know, those musical forms grew up in St. Louis and New Orleans. And I just thought it's interesting that these two cities not only have this sort of rich musical legacy, but also a French presence. And so I, I found actually in the university library, a collection of folk tales, French folk tales that were told in Missouri. And so that's how my current project started, actually. Um, it was just sort of happenstance that I came across that book. And also even more sort of a coincidence that I had just been learning French, like as a hobby uh, for long enough that I could read some of the tales in the book. That, you know, was really important because I was able to recognize this is not the same sort of French that I've been learning. This seems very different from from standard contemporary French. And um, and also the stories themselves were an interesting mix of things that are very familiar and then just completely bizarre and specific, you know, to the community itself. 
So I was really in, entranced by that. And that was at a time when there was quite a bit of coverage of the people in, in Old Mines, Missouri, who, um, you know, there, there was a group of people who were teaching Papa French in St. Genevieve and St. Louis. And so there was, there was a sort of flurry of media coverage at that point that, you know, the, the dialect is disappearing. People are trying to do something about it. Uh, so I sort of sat on it for a couple of years before I, I, you know, came to the realization that I should drive out there and just see if I could talk to somebody, um, about all of this. And so that's how my project really started. I, I met, um, Natalie Vilmer, who has really devoted most of her adult life in one way or another to, to preserving her ancestors' legacy in, in old mines. And she really helped a lot and put me in touch with a linguist that she worked with in the 1970s to document, you know, some of the last native speakers in the area too. I'm always curious now because I've obviously, I didn't know a ton about the Franco story in that region at all growing up here in New England. Uh, but I did have the opportunity, we had an episode on St. Genevieve and in, in that whole area, which was really, really cool. Is it safe to say that outside of that, maybe that immediate facility, the French story is not entirely well known? Yeah, I mean, I grew up on the other side of the state um, from there and didn't really know much about it. Um, you know, they, they tell us about the French trappers having a presence in, in, in Missouri and, of course, Lewis and Clark uh, whenever they came through. So sure. that seems to be kind of the beginning of, of the story, right, whenever, or the narrative whenever you're in high school or, or grade school. Even for people who are local, I actually had an aunt who lived in DeSoto, Missouri, which is very close to old mines. Um, and, you know, whenever I started working on this project, my dad, he hadn't really told me, but my grandma, you know, thought that we were related to the French people from the area, but she never had time to really like look into it. She just had an obituary. And so he said, okay, if you're going to St. Genevieve, sure. take this and check it out. And so it did check out like that, that we are related to the Greyfart family it was one of the first families to kind of settle in, in St. Genevieve. And it, it's just, I don't know, it's bizarre how these things kind of come together. Uh, and I don't know if I ever would have found out, <laughs> you know, if I if I wouldn't have been working on this project. Yeah, the, the story's not that well known even here. Probably people who grew up in St. Louis, you know, have a, a better idea because St. Louis has a lot of pride. And St. Genevieve, obviously, too, has a lot of pride for their French heritage. And there are a bunch of, you know, towns along the Mississippi on, on both sides of Missouri and Illinois that have the same sort of history. And um, it's really, I, my film, you know, I, I talk about Missouri's French Creoles, but they're a part of the Illinois country, really. Um, it's just that the culture lasted longest, I would say, uh, in, in Old Mines, Missouri. So let's talk about this film. For those who are looking to see the film, what can you describe the film? Because it's different. It's very, very cool. Well, thank you. The film is still in production. <laughs> um, it'll be a feature-length documentary. It's called Toujours Ici, which means still here. And what I'm doing is I'm really focusing on folklore and the way that folklore relates to history and our contemporary life, too. The people of Old Minds are really famous for having told these really terrific folk tales. In the 1930s, 72 of them were transcribed. And in the 1970s, whenever another group of researchers came in to try to document the dialect, even more of these stories turned up and were collected. Now, these are sort of folk tales that are really similar to the ones that are told in Canada or in New England or Louisiana. They all have that same mix of like European influence, Native American influence, and African influence, but just a different mix of, of those elements just you know, that reflects the population of, of the Illinois country. So I'm animating a couple of those folk tales. One of them is what you saw. It's called Chascalerit. And it's a short uh, folk tale about a hunter uh, that was told by a man named Pete Buyer. And he was, you know, among the last generation of, of native speakers of French in, in the area. And I was just really lucky to, that, you know, that there was a recording made of him telling this story because, and I chose it because not only is the story terrific, but it's not published anywhere. Um, so all of the collections that were made, 
you know, it shows you that they, they still missed, I mean, who knows how many stories were not collected that were really popular. And so that's one. And another one that I'm working on presently, I'm about halfway finished with the animation for this one. It's called Le Petit Beau au Corn d'Or, uh, The Little Bull with Golden Horns. I might change the title just because it's not that <laughs> exciting. Uh, but anyway, that's what it's called in, in the collection uh, published by Caddy. This one was transcribed in the 1930s, and it was told by an older, an elderly gentleman who I haven't found reliable birth dates for him, but he was an old man in the 1930s and had a very, very rich vocabulary and a good control over the French dialect in the region. So I wanted to include it because this transcription, you know, was made phonetically so we can, we understand using that kind of how it sounded. And then obviously we have, you know, even better examples from the audio recordings that were made. So I'm using that and um, we'll be narrating it and and people will be able to watch these in the French dialect with, you know, English subtitles or, or maybe, you know, French subtitles too, uh, if, if that's something that they're interested in doing. Um, and then the rest of the film is yeah. really live action, like, you know, documentary footage that I've been shooting in the present day, so with people that are still living in old mines. The artwork, because as the gentleman is telling this story of the Chasse Gallerit, I hope I'm pronouncing that somewhere right. Yeah. You have your your art your artwork telling the story as well. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Because I would wonder as an artist, if I wouldn't be like nervous anxious going in trying to depict especially some of these better well-known stories that you know people have told over and over again that others have a definite image in their head of what the story looks like and now you got to come up with an image to go along with the gentleman telling the story i I think that would be tough it really was tough you know there's no time frame given really when the story takes place he doesn't tell you you know what he's imagining and so i really went back and forth on does this take place in the 1930s, when does it take place? And I decided that because of the themes in this story, which has to do with a hunter who wants to marry uh, the local Indian chief's daughter, that obviously limits the time frame a little bit. And it made sense to shift it all the way back to sort of the beginning of the French settlement of the region in the in the 1690s, really, because there are some documented there's some documented historical events that, that happened with these early marriages between French coureurs de, de bois or voyageurs who who married, you know, Indian women in the, in the area, usually in the Illinois tribe. Uh, in it, well, there are a bunch of tribes that made up the Illinois Confederation. And one of the best documented marriages is one between Marie Ruinza and Michel Echo. And so I kind of decided, okay, I'm just going to to treat this folktale as if it's sort of the, the fantasy version of these real events. Because that, I think, allows me then to, to segue into a discussion of, of the actual history in, in the region um, in the documentary. So it was pretty tricky. And, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to make sure that, like, representing the, the Kaskaskia you know, it's hard to know exactly how to go about that because there are so many conflicting reports of how people dressed and presented themselves from that time period. And so I, that was probably the hardest part in terms of figuring out how the characters should look. I'm sure I got it wrong, but I tried to do the best I could. And there are a couple of like hand painted deer hides and buffalo hides, I think, that are kept in a, the, the music. Quai Branly in, in Paris that are, they, they think they come from the Illinois Confederation at about that time period. So I did incorporate some of those like robes into the, into the, into the film as well. So it, it's kind of fun to do that sort of visual research and then also just go off and, and be imaginative and, and kind of fill in some of the other gaps. But yeah, I mean, I think everybody has a very different idea of what these things look like if you just hear them as tales. And there is a pretty big responsibility, I feel, to to present something that is sort of unique, that will capture people's attention. And one thing that I want to do with this film is to, to not kind of make it so that people think, oh, well, these are the two folk tales from old minds that are the most indicative of, of, that, of that body of folklore or what, I don't know, whatever. I, I really want 
with this project to to pique people's interest and say, look, this is just a taste. There are so many other folk tales that are incredible that you could dive into if, if you think these two are cool. You know, each one of these tales has variations too, depending on who was telling it. That's something that, you know, in the documentary, I really want to drive home that this is a living tradition and it, and it can continue to be a living tradition. These tales um, play a central role in my film, Toujours ici, because they, um, linguists used them, like I said, over the course of the 20th century as a way to get people talking. So not only were they gathering these really interesting stories that survived possibly for close to 300 years, you know, um, in that community, they also are a great way of sort of gathering information about the local variety of the French language. And then I think that the tales also form sort of an interesting link between the the period where people were speaking French in this area and the time now when the, the French language has mostly disappeared. People like Natalie Vilmer, who I've been working with, her dad was one of the informants for these for these researchers that came through in the 1930s. He told some tales. Her aunt told a bunch of tales. Her grandfather did it almost like semi-professionally. I mean, he worked as a farmer and a blacksmith and earned a living, but he also told stories. And sure. She remembered him talking about walking, I think it was about eight miles from Old Mines up to Fertile, Missouri. And he would leave, you know, around dinner time. I think, tell stories all night and then walk home at one or two in the morning if he didn't stay up there, you know. So she heard all of those stories trans- translated into English. And that's how a lot of people now think of them, you know. So the stories made a transition from, from French into English. But because that demands so much effort, a lot of them ended up just kind of disappearing, right? And so maybe there are a few that, that sort of passed that that filter, you know. And of course, all of that was happening at the same time that TV and radio and everything was coming into people's lives. So there were a lot of pressures for these folktales to disappear. Gotcha. Now, and one thing I I got from from watching some of the clips that are available, and definitely I'm excited to see the the finished product. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Is that there is this whole, and, and obviously you're alluding to it here, this whole culture of storytelling. And you can tell the way that the people who tell, who are known as good storytellers have like esteem within their community as being people who others look up to for their ability to tell the story. So that I thought was very cool. I mean, the stories themselves are amazing, but the way you can use that as even just to show the importance of some of these individuals in their contribution to the culture, the ones who could tell these stories, I thought was awesome. Yeah, it was a really serious affair for people. I mean, it was a good time. You know, people were having fun, just like musicians. You know, there's a difference, I think, between someone who enjoys playing the violin, but maybe isn't like you wouldn't necessarily want to listen to them. (laughs) And uh, the instrument. Um, and I think that the same thing happened with the stories. Everybody could tell them, of course, if, you know, a few probably, but then there were people who everybody knew, like, you know, they were, they were in for a treat if, if, if this person was going to tell the story. And one of them, you know, is the storyteller that, that is the source for the, the one that I'm working on right now, whose name was Boy Borasa. Everybody in the 1970s on these recordings that I've been listening to, you know, when people would talk about the old storytellers, his name comes up consistently. Everybody talks about boy. Another one was Ben Coleman. Um, Those two were Carrier's informants. And then another researcher during from the same time period, his name was uh, Ward Dorrance. And he just gathered maybe, uh, I think maybe six Folk tales. There's a lot of overlap between what he gathered and what Katia gathered. But his informant was um, Natalie Vilmer's father, Max, like I said. And so, you know, there were a bunch of people who could tell them, and I'm sure they just scratched the surface, but they did an incredible amount of work in the 1930s. Something that's kind of interesting to note is that, you know, those informants were all men and the researchers were all men. So then in the 1970s, the primary researcher was Rosemary Hyde. And because she was a woman, she 
told me that, you know, she felt like she had better access to the to the feminine sort of perspective in old minds. So it was this whole complete other side of this of that universe, right, that maybe these guys had missed in some capacity. And so she, most of her best storytellers uh, were women at that point. There were a few guys that were also just very, very good in the 1970s. Um, but it's interesting to, to see, like, just, I mean, just the gender of the researcher can play a huge role in the kind of, you know, results that you get at any given time. No, that's awesome. That's really, really interesting. And one thing I did want to touch upon too, because I come across it all the time. Uh, you mentioned about how there, there's variety in these stories. Uh, you know, the stories are not necessarily told the exact same way every single time throughout history. That definitely ring a chord with me because I have a I'm, a, I'm a big, huge fan of the Chasse Gallery legend from Quebec, the very famous flying canoe legend from Quebec. I have a wood carving in my office at work of the Chasse Gallery that's definitely worth more than my actual car. And every time somebody comes in and asks me what that is about and wants the story, for me, it's awkward because I get to a certain point where I'm comfortable giving and then I stop and I'm like, well, it depends on which version from here now. Because here, it, there's a couple of different ways it's been told from this point on. And so I'm wondering if, if you ever ran into that. And if so, how do you make the decision of which path you were going to go down? Yeah, that happens quite a bit. Um, it happened with Chascalerit in Missouri as well. There were two men who told like a complete version of that tale. Pete Bouyer, whose tale I actually ended up using. And another man, uh, Les Ains. Bouyer. His name was Lezan Bouyer, but he um, he was not actually closely related to, to Pete. Uh, they're just a ton of Bouyers. Sure. And and they pronounce it Bouyer, but the in English today, uh, but the name is Boyer. Anyway, those two told this tale with some pretty big differences. Pete is the one who named the hunter Chascalerite. Chasca- tales of Chascalerite existed in old mines. I think normally he was going through this sort of flying through the sky with a pack of hunting dogs. So not necessarily with the canoe, but um, but he would have hunting dogs a lot of the time. And there was a story about Chascalerie with, he didn't, he wanted to go hunting on a Sunday morning instead of going to mass. That's the reason that he was condemned to hunt through the sky for all eternity. And he had a, he had a friend. And so anyway, that's, that's one sort of part of the tale, which is very different. Sure. Um, and then Lezin told the same actual, like the events are the same. He used a different name for the character. And actually the story was broken up into two separate tales. So you kind of like see, okay, like this is a modular thing. The story, like the name of the character could be anything. It doesn't seem to be that important to them, you know? But anyway, and so I chose Pete's tale because he was a little younger. He was easier to listen to. And also, he he's just more dynamic. Of a, he's more of a dynamic storyteller. So the pacing and all of that kind of had uh, played a role. Les Ains actually had maybe a better vocabulary, and but he had to search more for his words. So all of that kind of affects the pacing, right, of the film. So I made some decisions. And Pete also um, was a good choice, I think, because he played a really principal role in the 1930s, too. He worked at a store in Ricola, which is just a little bit north of Old Mines. And he's the guy that, like, Carrier, the researcher who gathered these things, had no luck when he first came through. I think he spent a year and he didn't really get any... No one trusted him. Even though he spoke French, people didn't trust him enough, really. And so he had a hard time. And then the second summer that he was there, someone told him, you need to go talk to Pete Boyer the, at the store. And so Pete was a young man at that point, maybe in his, I think he was in his 20s or maybe early 30s. And he took Carrier around and introduced him to Boy Borassa and Ben Coleman. And he said, these are the guys you need to talk to. You can use me as like you know, whatever credibility I have will get you in the door. So I think having that link He's the guy that actually took Carrier around is really important, even if maybe he wasn't. He is a great storyteller himself by the time this was recorded in the 1980s. But, you know, even if he hadn't been, it's nice to have that link, I think, too. There are a lot. There's a lot of variety. Very cool. And I did want to touch upon um, just the title of the film, um, for sure, because as someone, I mean, I started learning... French only a couple of years ago. I didn't really get comfortable with it until last year. So when I see 
toujours ici. First of all, I'm familiar with the sit because we use the same seat. A seat. We use the same word up here in New England. The toujours I thought was an interesting choice because to me, I look at it as like, is that still here or is that always here? And for me, that was kind of fun because toujours can kind of mean either one, which I thought was cool. So can you just talk about your choice of, of, of the title and how that ended up happening for you? The choice of the title really was because I found that expression evocative. There, there was a sign painted by a local named Kemp Bone that said, Trois cent ans, on est toujours ici. And it became kind of famous whenever people would come through to cover the people of old mines, they would see that sign and take a photo of it. And so it really became sort of a symbol of this community. And like you said, there is some ambiguity in how to interpret toujours, which I like because it could mean we're still here or, you know, we've been here for <laughs> for 300 years and uh, we've been here the whole time. Um, I also like that because it could mean always, there's the, it sort of refers to the future in a way too. By getting rid of the 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 trois cent ans, toujours ici, just sort of I think, you know, can speak more to, you know, the the deep roots that they have in this area, but also an idea that there's a future as well. And of course, ici is you know sort of a North American French variation on 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 ici. Uh, so I liked that it had that sort of uh, that word as well in the expression. Very awesome. Well. All these all these stories are way, way cool, but we have to talk about, obviously, in this film, the fact that there's more than just the stories, right? You're telling, you ha- you're, ta- you're focusing on the people who are there now. And so, you give us kind of an idea. If I was to go to Old Mines, by the way, show, looking at some of your footage, I'm pretty sure I want to for uh, New Year's Eve, because that looks like an absolute blast. For those who, if I was to go to hang out at Old Mines now, what what am I looking at? So if you go to Old Mines today and there's not some sort of an event going on, uh, the chances are pretty good that you will drive through and not even realize that you were there. You'd probably notice the church alongside Highway 21, uh, and that's St. Joachim's Parish. And it's truly the, the heart of this community of Old Mines. And it has been for 200 years. They're celebrating the 200th anniversary of, of the parish this year in, in 2022. So the, this presence of the church and the relative isolation of the community, you know, they really played a principal role in making sure that the culture, the French Creole culture, survived in old mines through the 20th century, when there were just so many, there was so much pressure for, for them to assimilate. And so what makes old mines really special, and what I really want to show in my film, is that it's it's an everyday part of of life. It's not something that really is geared towards tourists. It's just it's just life is still lived in in the same in many ways the same way. Although a lot of things have changed. You know, one thing that really I have focused on with my film that that sets it apart from other films that I've seen that have that have gone to old mines or, or covered this this region is that I've really invested heavily in going through all of the archival material that has been gathered really beginning in the 1930s, um, but then there was a huge effort uh, in the 1970s, beginning with the Missouri Friends of the Folk Arts, Natalie Vilmer, who I mentioned, and Rosemary Hyde Thomas, uh, the linguist who came through. They, in the 1970s, recorded hundreds of hours of interviews with with locals. And so what's kind of um, resulted from all of that is that uh, it's hard for me to, I guess, really articulate what makes Old Mines so special for someone who's just visiting today because I've spent an equal or maybe more time with, you know, these recordings of people who have, who've passed away, that last generation of, of French speakers, as I have with people who are still living there today. And so I have this, these access to these layers of time in one place. And I think that'll come through in the film because you you start to see these threads that are connecting people over generations, right? And um, I think that's really what makes Old Minds really special is that you can look at how people were engaging with each other in the past and you see those echoes today that 
are not really just like your average sort of American small town experience. Um, so there's something very special there. But, you know, the things that make it very special are things that also make it really hard for tourists <laughs> to uh, to appreciate. And so if you don't know anyone in Old Mines and you're really interested in the Illinois country and that, you know, the French history here, my recommendation is to go to St. Genevieve, um, Missouri, which is about an hour away from Old Mines. It's right along the Mississippi, easy to get to from St. Louis. And it was, it, it's an older settlement than St. Louis, and it was really the center of commerce at, at, during its heyday. So what happened is that there's just a huge amount of this French colonial architecture that's preserved in St. Genevieve in its original location. So you get like a really good idea of how, of the scale of things and how walkable it is. And it was recently made a national park, actually, so, you know, there, there are displays and people, guides there to help you make sure that you're really getting everything you can out of your experience. It's just an incredible place. And they actually have three out of the five pot uh construction, like, houses in the United States. It's incredible. They also have the common field. It, it It's still there. It's still unfenced, It just like it was Um you know, in the 1750s and 60s, there was a flood, I guess, so 1790s. You know, it, it the field itself played a really important part in the Illinois country and, and French settlements in, in North America because the soil was so fertile that they supplied, you know, all of the wheat for, for people. So anyway, that's I would really recommend going there and seeing everything that they have to offer as a way to kind of get your feet wet and start meeting people. The other thing is that, like, if you if you go at a if you can plan your trip accordingly, you can go to old mines when an event is going on, and that probably would be the best uh, overall situation because you could see Saint Genevieve, and then you could go maybe to the Fête de l'Automne in uh, old mines, which is something that's put on by the Old Mines Area Historical Society. It's the first weekend in October. They have Dennis Stromat playing uh, music and there's dancing and food. And then another s- sort of festival that's really public facing in Old Mines is called the Rendezvous. They have two of them. There's one in the spring and one kind of in the fall. And they uh, are kind of like a living history sort of festival. Next year, in a, on top of those two things, next year is huge for Old Mines because it, they're going to be celebrating the tricentennial of, of their community of you know, French presence in La Vie Mine. And so there are going to be events going on really every month. They're still being planned. But, you know, if you want to visit Old Mines in 2023, that's going to be um, a very special time to come, I think. Yeah, I mean, you're telling, telling Mike to uh, maybe we got to schedule the French Canadian Legacy podcast field trip. This has been very, very cool. I've had an awesome opportunity to talk about Toujours Isit and the filmmaker, Brian Hawkins. Brian, if somebody wants to watch this film, where can we send them? People who want to check this out, who want to make sure to get noticed when it's available, how can we make sure people have the opportunity to view this? The best thing to do is to go to my project's webpage um, on the Center for Independent Documentaries website. We have a, a relationship, the, the CID and, and me. So any donations that people want to make to the production of the film are tax deductible. And whenever the film is finished, they will, of course, be notified and, you know, we'll have, we'll have um, you know, some publicity through, through the CID. They, uh, so that website is documentaries.org slash toujours hyphen isit and that's um t-o-u-j-o-u-r-s i-c-i-t-t-e with a hyphen between the s and i sorry <laughs> um so anyway that, no, that would no, be, very cool uh that would be the best place uh you can also check out my uh personal website which is brianhawkinsartist.com and there, you know, you'll be able to, there's links to my Instagram, which is mostly what I use, I guess, for social media. So people can see clips there. I'm also releasing these short 
uh, animations of the folktales sort of independently of the project, just as a way to kind of start reaching out to people. We wouldn't know each other if if um, Alarit hadn't been shown at the at the OIF, and so um, it's possible that people can catch it at a festival. Uh, I don't have any on the horizon right now, but you know, I've applied to to a bunch, and so we'll see. Uh, you know what ends up coming through for the fall, and then yeah, that's that's the best way for people to 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 find out about the the project whenever it's finished. Following those things, I really appreciate that you had me on, though. I, I, it's really fun to to reconnect. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely glad we had this opportunity. I appreciate you very, very much for coming on. I think it's going to be super exciting. We'll definitely make sure Mike links in our like descriptions to put links directly so they can be able to follow you. So definitely really appreciate you coming on, Brian. This is awesome. Well, thank you, Jesse. Now our fathers look at us and sigh with despair To think that everything they love we simply do not share But the spirit never dies, our culture will survive each of us must choose how much to keep alive. Each of us must choose how much to keep alive. Special thanks to Josie Vashon for providing the music. You can find more about her at josievashon.com. This podcast was produced and edited by Mike Campbell. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at fclpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at fclpodcast for more information about the topics discussed. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this episode.